After seeing the Mauritania players have to a cappella their national anthem, we would like to offer our brand new theme as a replacement for their next game. But listeners, we need some lyrics, so please hit us up. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 33, and the second of our AFCON specials. As always, I am Rory, and I'm joined by my very good friend, Tommaso, and together we are the Anglo-Italian pod. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're super excited to be here, as always. But first, remember to follow us on Instagram at Anglo-Italian pod and on Twitter at Italian Anglo pod. Rory, how are you today? I am very good. It's been a bit of a long day, finally getting into the mode of getting back to work after the Christmas period, but I'm good. We've been talking football. We've had a special guest. It feels like we're back, Tommy. It feels like we're back. We are are back. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. This first week of work back at school was quite stressful. The Italian government is doing everything possible to make uh, the situation at school be as complicated as possible, but, you know, we are coping with it. And... uh, I have a big smile on my face because, yes, ladies and gentlemen, yes, 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 we are going to cover the AFCON and that's going to be the focus of our podcast for a month. But how could we forget about our origins? How could we forget about the Premier League? How could we forget about Serie A? And how could we forget about the fact that last night... Alexis Sanchez, one of the very favorites of the pod comes on as a substitute and that the 121st minute is at the right time at the right place to beat Perin, make it 2-0 and give Simone Inzaghi his very first piece of silverware at Inter Milan to make it two in a row for the Nerazzurri Scudetto and Super Cup. It's a fucking good day. Yes! May I was... So happy to see that it was, as you said, Alexis Sanchez is definitely one of the pod favourites. I've covered it before. As an Arsenal fan, I have now forgiven him for his move to Manchester United because he was terrible there. I love him. He was incredible at Arsenal. And it's so good to see him at Inter getting a bit more of a starting role now. It feels like Inzaghi is really starting to trust him. He's he is a key. He is a player that's capable of coming up at these key moments. It's great to see him with a smile on his face again. To see him come up in this clutch moment and get the winner, I was so happy it was him. And I was even more delighted to see just how angry it made Bonucci, who is going to be in real trouble now after literally punching and slapping an assistant referee on the side of the pitch. Tommy, how much trouble is he in? Can we just talk about that before we talk about how great Inter are? I I thought it was the Inter secretary, man. It was the I secretary saw, I, of the, staff the, of Inter Milan. The thing I read was like it was a match official, but I'm not sure. Ooh, I don't know, but Bonucci went fucking crazy. The cool thing about that is that he was warming up to take his penalty, but he never <laughs> did. Yes, Leonardo Bonucci, you never took that penalty, and that's a, a big L for the Bianconeri. Look, they put up, considering the situation that they're in, considering the fact that they didn't have uh, Chiesa, of course, which mm-hmm. is out injured, they didn't have Quadrado in the league t- because they were uh, squal- disqualified for the game. They put up quite a fight. And I have to say that I was fuming at the Inter players. After 10 minutes of game, we had the six shots and we were not able to convert a single one of them. Look, when Inter are hit their form, hit their stride during a game, they feel quite unstoppable. But the Champions League is coming up next month against the Liverpool, and we need to convert as many chances as possible. In the, I, I, I have Liverpool in my mind constantly. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yeah, if they yeah. do the same against Liverpool in the opening 10 minutes of our game at the San Siro, I'm going to absolutely rip my hair off. It's, mm. they, they, we need to convert. But yeah. did you have a chance to watch the game last night? Um, I was watching the AFCON, but I did see the highlights. And from what I saw, it was a very conservative performance from Juventus being polite I think they just kind of were there to stop Inter from playing really I don't think they really in classic Allegri style like what do we really expect from Allegri's team really um and yeah from what I saw Inter should have been much more comfortable credit to Juventus but true the 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 light side won out in the end as Juventus were defeated I think we can all be happy about that right and Juve Twitter today has been a lot of fun just lots of bitter Juve fans saying that they didn't care anyway, despite the fact that 
on Amazon all or nothing yesterday, last year. They made a massive deal about winning the Supercoppa, so they definitely did care. Oh, you know that I never finished watching the documentary. Do they mention oh, the finish Supercoppa? It, finish it. Do finish they mention it? it? What do they say? Yeah, yeah. Well, they they do make a big deal. Like these documentaries always do, right? They have to make a big deal out of like winning tiny things, but they make a big deal about it being Pirlo's first silverware and about this is the first step on a ladder. Maybe what you're doing with Inzaghi now, but this is the first step on a ladder of winning more things. Um, and they make the Coppa Italia seem like the Champions League, which is always great fun. And look, besides the football, which, uh, I mean, in the first half, Inter, Inter played pretty well. Then the rest of the game, we were the most, do- the more dominant team, uh, but there weren't as many uh, clear-cut chances as in the first half. Mm-hmm. I have to absolutely tip my hat to all of the Inter management. Last year, let's not forget, right after Inter Milan had won the Scudetto, Everybody put a big line over Inter Milan for what concerned the following season. The management has done insanely well. The Lukaku deal replaced by Zeko. Hakimi replaced by Dumfries, and it's paying off. Let's not forget that besides Conte leaving and these two players that I have just mentioned, we experienced something that was kind of unprecedented at this high level in football our best midfielder suffering a stroke Mm -hmm. during a match. And that was a third loss on the pitch that we had to to replace. And Mm -hmm. Akan Kalyanolu came in. I don't even know how that deal turned out, but it's these three players have been pivotal in this um, in this team. And about Alexis Sanchez, I also loved that recently his interviews were quite uh, Let's say they were quite careful. He would mm-hmm. he l- delivered the message that he wanted to play more. While last night with the winning goal at the 121st minute, we're just like, guys, I'm a fucking lion. If you make <laughs> me play more, I swear to God, I can fucking destroy every single defense. And another name that deserves a shout out is Matteo Darmian. Jesus oh. Christ. Matteo Darmian, besides being pivotal in last year's Scudetto run towards the end of the season, he had a few clutch goals, usually assisted by Akimi, a few clutch assists. This time, he assists wonderfully Alexis mm-hmm. Sanchez to make it 2-1 at the death of time at the San Siro and win the Super Cup. And it- Rory, since we like a bit of trivia, out of 88 games at Inter Milan, how many goals and how many assists for Alexis Sanchez? Oh. All right, 88 games, how many goals, how many assists? I'm going to say he's got, I don't want to overshoot it, so I'm going to say around 15 to 20 goals. Dude, the first number was correct, 15. Really? That's not bad. And assists, assists? I'm going to say 12. 21 assists. So My guy. I thought that he would be kind of a Podolski deal. You remember Mm -hmm. when Podolski came to Inter Milan? I forgot that completely. Did he play for Inter? That that happened. He was playing alongside the Shakiri as well, man. Was that after Arsenal or before Arsenal? It was after Arsenal. After Arsenal. After okay, Arsenal. Right, right, right. Uh, but I'm, uh, I thought it would be a Podolski kind of deal, kind of a done player. But instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's proving the haters wrong. So good job, Alexis. And finally, the last name that I need to shout out to. Fucking love that guy, man. I owe him so many apologies. Simone Inzaghi. I love him. <laughs> he destroyed. Did you see that he destroyed a banner on the sideline by kicking it? Oh, really? I just missed that. <laughs> Inter weren't awarded a penalty and he just went berserk. He kicked the billboard, destroyed it, and you can <laughs> see you can see the lines, just the, the assistant referee just going to him and literally holding him back. Just like, dude, you need to calm the fuck down, buddy. Tamori um, Ketz Bayer esque. I like it. I'm all hey, about that. He's won, he's won three Super Cups and they all came against the same team, Juventus, Juventus, Juventus. Twice at Lazio being the underdog. This time he was not the underdog. But this game, it's not that we had to win it. We couldn't lose it. I see it mm-hmm. that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I don't know. I think it's the start. Uh, last year with the Scudetto was the start of a, of a, an impressive run for Inter, and it's beautiful to see that it's continuing. So mm-hmm. props to the boys, props to the management, props to Simone Inzaghi. I'm super happy. Of course, it wasn't a crazy celebration like the Scudetto, but hey, another piece of silverware in our cabinet, and I'm super happy about it. It is a good. It is like I think to assert your kind of like we're still at that level. 
there's lots of talk about how this inter team are arguably better than Conte's inter team, and how oh, yeah. I think we've said before that inter are kind of. I think they're comfortably better than most teams in this league. Like, if yeah. not all the teams, I think they're comfortably the, be the best team. So it's a real statement. You're right. I think if Juventus win that, maybe there's a bit of doubt, a bit of all these, like, players for the big occasion. Is Inzaghi for the big occasion? And look, you want your... If there's one team you want your manager to have a habit of beating, it's probably Juventus, right? Oh, yeah. You're like, okay, let's keep that habit going, please. Let's go. Absolutely. But it wasn't the only cup action uh, across Italy and England. And Rory already has a big smile on his face as I'm saying <laughs> this. Because last night, Ch the Chelsea, uh, managed by Thomas Tuchel, who has now won nine out of nine semifinals in his career, mm -hmm. managed to score one goal. And that was enough against Rory's favorite team. Spurs. Rory, <laughs> what, what do you say about the two overturned penalties, the offside goal? Did it make it all the sweeter for you? Oh, honestly, it was beautiful. The the, the the Spurs Twitter account had an absolute nightmare last night. So they tweeted penalty, like celebrating, and then obviously it wasn't a penalty because the foul was outside the box and it definitely wasn't a penalty. So then they had to backtrack. Then they tweeted it's like a cauldron in it. Oh, no, the, the atmosphere is electric tonight. And then the next tweet was 1-0 Chelsea, which is unbelievable. Um, we've gone from, Tommy, a team that is in a habit of winning trophies at the moment into to a team that, I'm going to say this now, 5,027 days since Tottenham last won a trophy. There's a Twitter account that I follow, which is just, how many days since Tottenham last won a trophy? And every day they just add a number. Uh, so it's now 5,000. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to um, say that again. To the Tottenham fans that were posting about Arsenal getting kicked out of the FA Cup, there was one in particular, which was winning the FA Cup isn't for everyone with a picture of Harry Kane. It was like, you're saying this to the team that's won it the most times with a picture of a player who's never won anything. Like, weird yeah. flex, but okay. But anyway, personal... Agendas aside, um, Tottenham looked an absolute mess. Um, I don't know how Doherty is still getting a game for, for Spurs. He genuinely is a terrible player. Potentially why they're looking at Adama Traore. It looks like that deal is getting closer. Although a player that has one goal in the last two seasons, I don't know if that's really what you need from wing back, but go for it. Um, I think Spurs just look a little bit lost. I think Conte is getting the most that he can out of this squad. Um and we know he I, he looks like he's really trying. I don't think it's him. It is the squad. And there was a press conference this week where he was asked about the transfer window and he just was really, he looked like a kind of broken man. He was defeated. And he was just like, I've told them I need new players. We need improvements. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. And it looks like he's kind of discovered what working with Daniel Levy is actually like. Um Compare that to a team in Chelsea with Tuchel who are incredibly well coached. Um, like you said, his record in semifinals is unbelievable. I think these are just two teams in very different places. The problem for, for Tottenham is, I think Conte, he only signed an 18-month contract, right? It was a short-term contract. I think that's on purpose. And he would he's a manager that will just walk away. Like He walked away from Inter, right? If he's not happy in that project, he will just walk away. So I think... The, the concern for Tottenham fans is that if Levy doesn't change, and let's face it, Levy isn't going to change, Conte won't be there for long. And then who do you get next? I think I, I don't want to slag off Tottenham too much because we're playing them this weekend and form goes out of the window, especially when we play them away. We've not beaten them away in quite a long time, I think. So I don't want to slag them off too much. I just think they look a little bit lost at the moment. Um, and Chelsea are looking... Just ruthless as ever, really. A nice, efficient win, beating them 2 0 at home, 1 0 away. Easy. Hopefully, they'll be facing Arsenal in the final, but I'm not holding my breath about how we're going to do tonight. A few takeaways from the game Kepa with two very good saves and also a very, very smart decision, as Roy was making me notice mm -hmm. on, the off, on the offside goal that was, uh, of course, ruled uh, out uh, for Tottenham. Uh, Golini. Had a very good save on Lukaku at the beginning of the game, and then an absolute howler. I hate when goalkeepers go for butterflies, as we say in Italian. And uh, yeah, it's funny that I say it because I support Inter, and our goalkeeper is Andanovic. And our future <laughs> He's always hunting butterflies. Is yeah. Onana, but okay. But then another thing I have to say about Tuchel, um, another great quality of his 
man management, dude. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we were on winter break and we didn't cover that massive Lukaku story, that <laughs> incredible interview, that <laughs> unprecedented, I want to say, in football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was just like, this guy is going to be out for the rest of the season. But apparently, Tuchel just like understood that the best thing to do was just to talk to him and make him understand how bad the timing was. Mm -hmm. And right now he gave him a chance and it looks like Lukaku is delivering. From what I saw from the highlights, of course, I was busy watching the Super Cup in Italy. But it looks like he had a pretty mm -hmm. decent game yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, he's fitting into the system finally. So, yeah, props to Thomas Tuchel. We will have to wait to see who Chelsea are going to play in the final. Because tonight, after we are recording, of course, on a Thursday, after we'll be done, Rory... Will make himself a cup of uh, herbal tea, do some meditation, and then turn on the TV, watch Arsenal Liverpool. I'm just going to very, very quickly say that you Jurgen could sound Klopp like an cheated, idiot by the time this right? podcast is out, dude. Be careful. Jurgen Klopp has cheated, right? He lied about nine positive COVID tests that he now said he said there were ten positive COVID tests, nine of which. Have, are now apparently false positives, right? The odds of getting one false positive are like 0.0001%. Getting nine is ridiculous. He got the game rearranged, fine, whatever. But now we have Erdegaard out, we have Tommy Asu out, we have, um, I think, Xhaka's out. We've got five first-team players missing and we're still going to have to play the bloody game. It's fine. We weren't going to win anyway. It's Liverpool. We're going to lose. I just think it needs to be on record that Jurgen Klopp has cheated when it comes to COVID protocol. And people need to talk about it. He should be punished. He won't be. But he cheated with it. Fine. The dark Done. side of Jurgen is starting to come out after those He's uh, after really those declarations. starting to annoy me. He's yeah, really after, starting to annoy me. After um, those there's... statements against the AFCON and now doing this, Jurgen, uh, what's going on, bud? Yeah, a lot of his press conferences are really like unnecessarily rude to journalists. Um, just moaning constantly. Now, I know managers moan, but my God, this guy moans. This thing with COVID, I just feel like there's a few things now where I'm like, ah, actually, I'm the shine is starting to kind of fade from Jurgen. I think it's not just me. There's a lot of people who are like, what is this guy doing? Like, just concentrate on managing the bloody team. Like, I don't know. And the COVID thing really annoyed me because it's not something that you should be looking to get a sporting advantage from. Like, people, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't want to get too holier than now, the, the but I just rules, don't the think rules it's are a... annoying. The rules are fucking annoying for mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah. Absolutely everybody. And when you try to, you know, go around those rules and be favored uh, against your rivals. That's that's not the way to do it. And, like, think. lastly, like, the last... They shut down the training, the training complex, and literally the day after the game was meant to be played, they opened the training complex because it was all fine again. It was like, bloody hell, that was a quick cure. Can you give that to the rest of the country because we could do with it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was... It was just... I might be being cynical, but I don't think I am. And also at a team like Liverpool that brag a lot about integrity and sportsmanship yeah. and so mm -hmm. on. But yeah. ladies and gentlemen, this was our little talk about the Italian Super Cup and the Carabao Cup. It's now time to review all of the action of the first round of fixtures in the group stage of the AFCON. Stay tuned afterwards too, because we've got a very good AFCON-related interview with a guest from... We're not going to tell you yet. And after that, we are going to quickly review the upcoming games in the AFCON, in Serie A, and in the Premier League. Rory, have you inflated the blimp? Are you ready to take it across the Mediterranean and into Africa? This is its longest journey. I hope I hope she's got the strength. Let's see. Let's try it right now. And here we are. It is time for our first AFCON review on our Friday episodes. And we have got lots to talk about, despite there being a slight trend in the score lines, which I think we'll get onto. I think there's been still plenty of headlines, plenty of games to talk about. Now, as we said, we already kind of covered Group A and B in our Monday show, so we're going to be starting all the way down in Group C, where the group leaders currently are Gabon on three points, second is Morocco on three, and then Comoros on nil, and Ghana on nil. Now, we're going to talk about Gabon one, Com Comoros nil. Now, Tommy, I know you were really impressed with the goal in this game, right? Holy shit, dude. Bupenza. 
Bupenza, what a fucking goal, man. That was incredible. That was one of the goals that I selected as the best goals since the beginning of the tournament. Just, uh, he didn't really have the right to shoot from there, right? And it went in, and it was a beauty, a beauty of a strike. What did you make of the game as a whole, my friend? Yeah, the, the goal was incredible. Right across the front of the goal, into the opposite corner. Absolute rocket. I love to see a front flip, back flip celebration. Always makes me a little bit nervous, but I do enjoy it. Um, for Gabon, well, they definitely made me eat my words, right? You know, guys, on this pod, any anything we say, the opposite will happen. I said Gabon were going to lose and struggle. They won and fairly comfortably. Now, for Comoros, we know it's their first ever AFCON, right? They're definitely like minnows. I think they didn't disgrace themselves. But Gabon made it pretty comfortable, played some nice stuff at times, and have now given themselves a chance to get through the group, especially, as we said, with Ghana looking so poor. I think Comoros have really put... the um, Gabon, sorry, have put themselves in a really good position. And upcoming, they do have Ghana next, so it's a big opportunity for them to really put their foot down and maybe get into the knockout rounds. So Group C looking nice and close. Um and Morocco, like I said, were fairly convincing against, again, a terrible Ghana. Um, so it should be between the, those two teams, I think. But for Gabon, things can only really get better as well, as they have Mario Lamina and Aubameyang to return. Even if Aubameyang isn't in the greatest form, I think we might see him put a proper shift in for Gabon because he does like to kind of shut up the haters and then flex on Instagram. So I think we could see him maybe put in a few uh, captain's performances. Beautiful. Let's move on to Group D, where you will never guess the first game of the group ended 1-0. And here <laughs> is yet another goal that I selected as one of the best goals of the tournament so far. The name is, of course, pretty well known, especially if you follow English football. And it was from Iyanacho against Salaz Egypt. So kind of a bit of the Premier League within the AFCON. This goal was scored at the 30th minute in the game Nigeria versus Egypt. I did watch extended highlights. And by the way, I just wanted to tell our listeners that if you're struggling to find the streaming to watch these games, if you're struggling to find the highlights... It's actually much simpler than you think. You just have to go to YouTube and type CAF space TV, so CAF TV, and you can see all of the highlights. And even better, you can watch the live games. Now, if you want to watch extended highlights, then you will have to go somewhere else. But these videos are pretty thorough. I mean, as thorough as you can be in 2 minutes 30. Now, what <laughs> I got from these extended highlights, and we will hear it in our interview later. I'm not going to tell you who it is, though. Um... It is kind of true that Egypt rely solely on Salah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you can, uh, if you can avoid the ball to get to Salah at that point, it's pretty easy stuff. Not that easy since Nigeria were able to score only one goal. But I think that this is a very important three-pointer for Nigeria. Definitely the toughest game mm -hmm. in a group where there are Sudan and Burkina Faso. And so starting off with three points uh, is definitely a great, great beginning of the tournament. Well, there was a key player in that performance as well, Wil Wilfred Ndidi won the ball back 13 times uh, in that game and was absolutely key in that midfield. Now, we know he's a player who's been incredible and, again, very key for Leicester. This Nigeria team just has little kind of like star power dotted everywhere. And I think before the tournament, there was a lot of Nigeria fans who weren't convinced by the manager, weren't convinced by the squad. And I think this performance, they were playing some nice football and people are okay. Nigeria might actually be turning up here. Um, they've got some, really, yeah, like I said, really good players, great performance. Egypt were disappointing, but a good start for them. And despite the fights, play fights going on in the in the camp before the game, Iheanacho got the key goal with a beautiful, like really composed, hard finish. Um, and as we know in this tournament so far, once you score one, you've won. So it's like next goal wins, but not quite, right? <laughs> it's um, It's been good, but for Nigeria, you're a great start. Also, great to see a lot of fans in the stands from Nigeria. Of course, mm -hmm. that's due to the geographical proximity between Nigeria and Cameroon, which are bordering states. Uh, one thing that you guys should do whenever you read the names of these teams, I'll put myself first in the list. I'm very ignorant about African geography. I think that I can pinpoint probably on a mute map one-fifth of the states. Mm -hmm. 
And it's always kind of interesting to see how fucking big they are, the majority of them. You know that thing, right, about Africa, that it's not Mm -hmm. correctly represented in maps because you kind of have to stretch out the globe. And so Greenland actually looks much bigger than it is. But you have to think that Africa is actually twice the size that it's Well, you can fit fit Western Europe and North, North America into Africa. I'm pretty sure that's true. Damn. Well, I like yeah. it. I, I like I'm it. pretty sure that's true. Feel free to correct me. But another little stat I'm going to throw in there. Um, Nigeria are the first team to beat Egypt in the group stages of the AFCON in 18 years. Like, this was a big win for Nigeria, right? I think people really expected Egypt. Like, they usually make light work of the group stages. We've seen their record. They're the record holders of this competition. So this is a big statement win for Nigeria. And the moment that really caught my eye as well is after the game, one of the Nigeria coaches wandered up to Salah and asked for a selfie, which was like fresh off a 1-0 win to go up to the star player. But to be fair to Salah, he was very um, kind and calm and accepted the selfie. I just thought it was quite a great little moment at the end there. Yeah, and uh, in the other game of the group, Sudan, Guinea, Bissau, the most interesting highlight is the fact that Sudan played with two different kits, which they switched at a halftime. The reason is unknown. They were always red, of course, both by Adidas, but they were different designs. It's unknown why, but it's one of the I, beauties of this tournament. Some things just yeah, happen. Yeah, they don't need explaining. They just it, it they just happens. It happens. And happen. honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens in the Premier League within five years. You have a first half home kit, a second half home kit, a first half away kit, a second half away kit. Just anything. Arsenal this year have been prolific with merchandise, so I can definitely see that happening soon. So, guys, one thing, if you're a new listener of the pod, we don't sell ourselves as football experts, more like passionate about the game. And uh, I will be the first one to say that I'm very ignorant about a lot of things. And I just discovered that that by covering this tournament, that there are three different Guineas in Africa. And uh, so it's wrong to say that they played against Guinea. You have to specify it was against Guinea Bissau. But let's move on to Group E, Algeria, Sierra Leone, nil-nil. And the other game was Equatorial Guinea against Ivory Coast. Well, Algeria and Sierra Leone, we're going to very briefly cover this game because you might hear more about it later on in the show. All I'm going to say is my kind of performance of the match round is the goalkeeper Kamara for Sierra Leone. He had an unbelievable game, stopped everything that came towards him. In the post-match interview, he was in tears as he got the Man of the Match um, Man of the Match Award. He plays in the Sierra Leonean, I think that's the word, Sierra Leonean League. Um, and it was a great, great performance from him. Algeria slightly disappointing again. You'll hear more about it later. So we're going to quickly go to Equatorial Guinea, nil, Ivory Coast one. Now, if you um, listen to us on Monday, you will know that I am supporting Ivory Coast this tournament. They are my team. And I did really enjoy the performance. Um, They definitely should have scored a few more goals. Um, But in the sixth minute, Max Gradel with the outside of the foot, rocketed one into the top right corner. Really beautiful goal. Beautiful. Um, and at that point, I thought, okay, here we go. Ivory Coast, let's get a few goals, two or three nil. Let's get the entertainment factor up a little bit. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. It was a good game. Um, Equatorial Guinea had quite a few chances. And Sue, in particular, really should have scored. Uh, had a one-on-one with a keeper where he should have done a lot better. Um, But Equatorial Guinea, in general, missed quite a lot of chances. But then, so did Ivory Coast. Um, Pepe came off the bench, and whilst Pepe, he missed two or three fairly easy chances. Um, But what really stood out to me with with Ivory Coast is like how dynamic their attack is, right? So they started with Gradel and Maxwell Cornet, who we know is having a great season at Burnley. Like those two on the wing with Haller in the middle. Now, Haller had a bit of a quiet game. But uh, Gradel and Corne were unbelievable. And then in the 70th minute, Ivory Coast are able to bring on Wilfred Zaha and Pepe. Now, these are two players that, at the very least, are going to cause defense, like tired defenses problems with their pace, their directness. They're like dribbling, and they really did. Like they really increased the pressure on Equatorial Guinea at the end. I think having that, like that depth in the squad for Ivory Coast could be really key as the tournament goes on. Um, But the star player for Ivory Coast was Sangare in midfield. He created five chances, won the ball back 10 times, and wasn't dispossessed once. This guy plays for PSV and is really starting to get 
a bit of attention. Um, but for Equatorial Guinea, the players who stood out for me were the wing backs, actually. Akapo and Nchama both had really good games, getting forward, creating chances. So I think Equatorial Guinea didn't disgrace themselves, but Ivory Coast probably should have been a bit more comfortable. But three points, the, the elephants are on their way. Hey, nice French pronunciation, buddy. Thank you. Les éléphants. <laughs> and let's move on to Group F, Tunisia Mali, 0-1. And I want to say off the top of my head that this one of was one of the games with the most players who are actually active in Europe. Mm-hmm. And I expected a little more, to be honest, from Tunisia. The goal uh, was scored by Kone for Mali. It was a penalty at the 48th minute. But here, I'm going to highlight my uh, goalkeeper of the tournament so far, which is Munkoro for uh, Mali, who dives to the bottom right to deny a penalty to saint Etienne's striker, Kazri, at the very death of time, and the ice is the score at 1-0 massive three points for uh, Mali in a group where I think that the first one who gets the three points has a good chance of going through. We need to talk about this game. The referee. The referee. Now, this is insane. Now, before we do this, people have been like tarring the AFCON tournament with like, oh, it's terrible referee and this is like sums up the tournament. You get decisions like this in every every, uh, competition. Think about... Uh, Last season when the referee gave Brighton a penalty after the game had finished, right? Um, In La Liga, a a referee did it in Sevilla. This is not an AFCON problem, but this referee had an absolute stinker. So they've since blamed it on Heatstroke. Um, They have now banned him from the tournament. He's been investigated. So let me take you through his day. This is quite a... (laughs) A kind of eventful I day. I, I didn't know. I did read something, but I didn't. I didn't realize he had been taken out of the tournament. I didn't realize it went that far. So no this guy, it. let's go. So the first penalty for Mali, the defender knew nothing about the handball, right? The Tunisian defender. I think it was a little bit harsh. His arm was away from the ball, but away from his body. But I think it was a bit harsh. As you said, Kone scores the penalty. Text, textbook penalty, though. Yeah, I think... By, sorry, I th- not textbook, but by the book. Sorry, that's yeah. what I wanted to say. Yeah, by yeah. the book, yeah, it's I a penalty. Under the current rules, it's kind of... Yeah, it's a penalty. The second handball, I think, was definitely a handball. His arm was way out there. It's kind of uh, stupid defending. Um, as you said, a great goal, a great save even. But then this is where it all goes a little bit wrong for the referee. So at the 85th minute, he blows full time, Right? Everybody's really confused. The players all and the coaches are arguing. And then he just restarts the game, right? So he restarts the game. This In this half, they have had two VAR checks, a cooling break, and nine substitutions, right? So how much time do you think would be added on after those interruptions, Tommy? How much are you thinking? I don't know. Six, seven minutes? Six, seven minutes. Okay, well, he blows the whistle again at 89 minutes and 52 seconds. So the game doesn't even get to 90 minutes before he calls it again. At this point, the Tunisian bench goes crazy. They all start going mad. The players are going mad. The referee is surrounded by security. He walks off the pitch. The game's over, right? A few minutes later, Marley are finally convinced to come out on the pitch. Obviously, they don't want to play anymore. They've just won the game, right? So they're all in the change room. They're dragged back out, put their kits back on, dragged back out, and they stand there for what would only be three minutes added time. So even then, the ref has only gone, ah, oh, three minutes, that'll do you, right? They're stood there. They're waiting for Tunisia. Tunisia don't appear, right? The manager has said that the players were already in their ice baths. They were already leaving the stadium. He wants nothing more to do with it. They've made a complaint to CAF. This referee has been removed. Now, the interesting thing about this referee is that he's had... um accusations of match fixing thrown at him in the past. Um, So in a CAF Champions League match between Esperance and Radez, he gave two very controversial penalties. And there's a lot of kind of question marks around this referee. So it's really, it's a bit of a shame that this, that this has kind of overshadowed the tournament and that people are using it to kind of batter the AFCON, or typical AFCON, like Mickey Mouse tournament. It's not that. This is just a bad ref who had a terrible day. It happens in every league, but unfortunately, it did take the headlines. 
Wow, I didn't, I did, I did, I did miss a big part of this. To be honest, it and was a uh, crazy ending. I was watching it in a cafe in between classes on my phone. Like, what the hell is going on? Like, crazy, confused, crazy. But also, confused. guys, if anything happens on Twitter, chances are that Rory Chris Quolo will know about it within five seconds. So be very careful of what you tweet, <laughs> of whatever answer you post, whatever reply, because Rory Chris Quolo has got eyes all over the little bluebird, right? I spend far too much time on Twitter, far too much, but I kind of like it. It's a great app. It's a great app. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our sponsor, sponsor reveal, Twitter. Yeah, no, yeah. we wish. But um, Mauritania Gambia was the other game. Gambia, quite an interesting team for the supporters of Serie A, since we've got both Musa Barro and Colli, who plays for Spezia. And Musa Barro was the assist man for one of my favorite goals so far. It was uh, Giallo who scored in the 10th minute. Of course, it's not spelled like yellow in Italian. It's J-A-L-L-O-W. And it was a beautiful outside-the-box lefty chip to make it 1-0. And then Mauritania weren't really able to overturn the score, despite putting in quite a lot of effort. It looks like a team that knows how to run. The football abilities were not that impressive, but what I noticed the most about this game was really the grit that they had and the, the effort that they put in this first fixture. So every um, in, there haven't been any draws that is pretty interesting. There haven't been any draws so far. So each group features a team, two teams with three points and two teams with zero. However, just before we started recording, Cameroon got to play their second game of the tournament against Ethiopia and they did win it. And it wasn't a one nil this time around. We had five goals in one game. Listen, that's the sound of my brain when I read the scoreline. That's Four. nearly 50% of all of the amount of goals before <laughs> this game, right? That's actually very true. That's actually very, very true. The goals came from, actually, Ethiopia took the lead thanks to Otessa at the fourth minute. But then four minutes later, it was Ekambi who equalized. And then it all happened in the second half. With Abubakar, now the top goal scorer of the tournament with three goals, scoring a brace between the 53rd, four goals in the tournament? Four goals. He got he scored both penalties in the first game, right? True, 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 true. Four goals in the tournament. This time around, he scored a brace between the 53rd and the 55th minute, and then he just completely put the cherry on top 12 minutes later. Uh, sorry, uh, it was a Kambi who put the cherry on top 12 minutes later uh, with a goal at the 67th minute. That means that Cameroon are now top of their group with six points and the goal difference of four. Cape Verde are second at the three points, awaiting to take on Burkina Faso, who are at zero, and the Ethiopia are also at zero after two games with a minus four goal difference. I just wanted to give a bit of a kind of shout out to Ethiopia and just say that like, all but three of their players play in the Ethiopian league, right? Like this is a this is a team that are not playing like a you could say high level of football or like a kind of yeah a high level of football, but they're playing very well as a team. They have a clear identity. They have a clear kind of philosophy. They're in a difficult group. I just think obviously playing the hosts, they've got slapped a little bit today. But I think especially their first game. They've done incredibly well for considering a lot of their players or barely any of their players play abroad. Um, and I, I kind of like their, I like their attitude. Um, but unfortunately, Cameroon definitely put them to bed today. But it was good to see, as you said, good to see more than one goal in a game. Long may it continue. I think we may see more goals in the second round, but we will see. Yeah, Ethiopia, unfortunately, have won only one of their last seven games. And that win came against Zimbabwe on September 7th of last year. Well, the important is to participate, man. Mm -hmm. You miss all the shots that you don't take. Exactly. Ethiopia showed up. They even took the lead against the hosts. But unfortunately, then they were hammered by them. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, by tomorrow, by the time that you're listening on a Friday, you will already know the result between Cape Verde and Burkina Faso. Rory, since we're the podcast of Ron Predictions, what do you say? I'm going to say... Burkina Faso win because I think they're quite good. Yeah. 
Okay, wow. And, uh, I'm going to say Cape Verde, so one of the two is going to sound like an idiot okay. tomorrow. Great. One of us will be right. All right. So, Roy, is there anything to add about this first round of fixtures uh, in the group stage of the AFCON? I think that's it. We could just go through your your goal. of the, which, which is your favorite goal so far in the tournament? Man, I don't know which one to pick. They were I picked four because I just love outside of the box strikes. And I have to say one thing. I have to say one thing. In the Afghan, I've seen a lot of attempts from outside of the box. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Some yeah. of them, they've probably gone out of the stadium because I've seen that many stadiums. That's in Thomas Cameroon. Partey. That sounds like yeah, Thomas Partey. <laughs> that, that was definitely one of his. I have to say that probably my favorite one was the one by Ia Nacho against uh, Egypt because it's just super composed. Mm -hmm. it, nice. There is also half a turn involved in that goal and he just hammers it. The goalkeeper actually dives to save it, but there is nothing to do with a shot like that. Which one is yours, Rory? Um, I'm going to go for Sangare. It's the first goal of the tournament. It's a beautiful volley. It was a nice move from Burkina Faso, like from the corner, good pressure, and just that volley into the roof of the net. Aesthetically, very, very pleasing. But an honourable mention for Max Gradel because that genuinely got me out of my seat, that goal. Beautiful. Yeah, the one by Gradel was also mm -hmm. very, very nice. Do you think we're done with AFCON? Wrong. Because, ladies and gentlemen, get ready for our next host. Rory, do you want to introduce him? He is an Algerian journalist. He is based in London. He goes by the name of Dean Ami. He was a legend and he is going to be talking to us about all things Algerian football and AFCON. And here we are. It is time for our first guest as part of our AFCON coverage. And I am delighted to be able to introduce to you Dean Ami. So, Dean, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'll tell you what, I would have been a lot better if Algeria had won their opening game, but I'm OK, thank you. <laughs> I, I can imagine. I can imagine that was, uh, I can imagine that was a uh, frustrating watch. Um, but for the listeners, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell, tell us who you are, what you do um, and, yeah, how you feel about Algeria? Cool. So yeah, I'm Dean. I'm uh, I'm 24, and I am half English, half Algerian, mixed nationality. Um, I grew up in London. Uh, I went to university, did a degree in sports journalism, and that's when I started making a YouTube channel about uh, Algerian football in English because I grew up looking for Algerian football coverage, and it's always in Arabic or French. So I decided mm. to start. Uh, reporting it in in english and then of course you had you had leicester winning the league with with mares and then we got a little bit more publicity and uh and here we are today as reigning champions well that's it it's been a real like we're kind of living through a kind of golden period would you say of algerian football at the moment with you as you said being the holders of the afcon and winning the arab cup recently do you think this is like do you think it's a golden generation for the country or Oh, absolutely. And there is still huge expectation to qualify for the World Cup and get to at least the quarterfinals as well. And of course, we are currently at the time of recording this. We are 35 games unbeaten and Italy, I'm sure, as you know, have the record with 37. So we're coming for that. Are you? Hey, yes, I'm we here are. too, by the way. I wasn't really introduced. <laughs> sorry, I'm, Tommy. I didn't I'm, introduce I'm, I'm you, here sorry. chilling in the shadow, ready to get <laughs> triggered by what Dean says about the <laughs> Uh No, considering also the most recent Chiesa injury, I'm really trying my best not to think about that fixture against Macedonia and possibly the winner between Portugal and Turkey come the month of March. But Dean, it's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, we're going to discuss uh, everything about AFCON and Algeria in this interview with you. And uh, let's start from AFCON in general. So we decided, that actually, Rory had the brilliant idea to start covering the AFCON for this month. Uh, yeah, hats off to Rory. And uh, we wanted to ask you, so if you were to, uh, since you're a journalist as well, if you had to write a title and a subtitle to introduce this tournament to a newbie, what would you tell them? What could they expect from this uh, international continental tournament? Well, it's funny you should say that. I've always said with AFCON, the, the slogan should be expect the unexpected because literally anything can happen at this tournament. And in a way, that's what makes it so beautiful. It's just so unpredictable. Anything can happen. You've got all these, these star names like, you know, Salah, Mane, and yet 
Aubameyang and, and none of them have actually won the tournament. So it's always very exciting to see to see what goes on. You always love an underdog story. You, you saw, you know, for example, at the last AFCON, you've got Madagascar, absolutely unknown to making a quarterfinal. And it's got beautiful underdog stories. It's got players that have got second jobs that play football part-time, going deep into international tournaments, getting recognition. And then, of course, you've got your big nations coming together and your big players. And I just love, you love the beauty of it. You, you, you watch a football match, for example, you look at the the Ghana-Morocco game the other day and you had you had one goalkeeper from Sevilla and the other goalkeeper from Swindon and they're all on the same pitch. It's a level playing field and no matter how good you are as a footballer, even if you want to call, for example, Salah the best in the world right now, when you come into African football, anything can happen. Your form, your rating, your quality goes out the window. Anything can happen. And I just love it because when you watch a World Cup or a Euros or a Copa America, you kind of know this sort of three or four teams, five teams that are probably going to win it with AFCON. I genuinely tell you, anyone can win this trophy. And I think that's what makes it so fun to watch. And what is it, do you think, about African football that means that that can happen? Because you mentioned Salah, like the defender, he was completely marked out of the game against Nigeria and he barely touched the ball. And as you said about the certain players like Drogba famously never won it, despite being part of that incredible Ivory Coast team. Like, what do you think it is about the football or about the tournament that means that can happen? I just think that African footballers and people are fearless. They mm-hmm. fear no one. You know, you look at, for example, Algeria coming up against Sierra Leone and you've, despite the fact that you've got Riyad Mahrez, a, a multiple Premier League winner, doesn't bother the Sierra Leone players. They're not starstruck. They take the game to them. There's that. There's no fear factor. It's not like in the Premier League, oh, you have Sir Alex Ferguson in the, in the dugout. As soon as you see him, you think you've lost. This is, there's nothing. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's no, there's no fear. You go out there. And you play with your heart. It's not really to do with that much about, you know, tactical awareness. Of course, tactics are involved, but it's all about playing with your heart on your sleeve. And I think that's just what makes it so fun to watch. Beautiful. Um, well, you, you mentioned there the Sierra Leone Algeria performance uh, or the game. Now, the player that really stood out was the goalkeeper for um, Sierra Leone. He absolutely played out of his skin. I think the we we've all seen the video of him after the match and like he, him getting the man of the match performance. How much it meant to him, where he was in tears. It was a really beautiful thing to see. From an Algeria point of view, how did you feel about that performance? How did you feel about the game? Like, obviously, I thought we were going to win, but like, I didn't think Sierra Leone were a poor side. I think in the qualifying, they drew to Nigeria twice and they were 4 0 down in one game, drew 4 all. So you've got to have quality to actually qualify for the tournament. You don't mm-hmm. qualify as a fluke. So the fact that they qualified, they should have been given the respect. Like, I expected to win, but like, you know, 2 0, 3 0, not, not a thrashing. But the problem is, as soon as the game goes on longer, Sierra Leone confidence builds. They actually start thinking they can get a result and they actually start thinking 60th minute, 70th minute, we're making changes. They're looking resolute. And when you go through through the the keeper was amazing, Kamara, and you look at the defence and they bring in Stephen Corker, who's obviously played for England. And I think the fullback, uh, Kai Kai, uh, plays for QPR as well. So mm-hmm. like, it's not, we're not talking about complete nobodies here. These Half the defence has got, loads of appearances in English football. And I just think some people don't usually recognise that when they see the the name Sierra Leone on the team sheet. But at the end of the day, it was an unexpected result. It's it's the first time Algeria haven't scored a goal in nearly four years. But uh, we're hoping to bounce back in the next game. And like I say, break that Italian unbeaten record. So it's okay. <laughs> Man, it's all, I, I didn't expect this interview to be so much about my country, but I'm, I'm, actually, <laughs> I'm actually liking this uh, Italia Algeria rivalry. By the way, funny story. Years ago in Milan, in the center of Milan, Rory knows what I'm talking about. Colonne di San Lorenzo is this beautiful little square. And back in the day, uh, you could spend your entire Friday and Saturday nights there. And I remember a pretty drunken Friday night that uh, kept on going until like five in the morning into the Saturday. And um, we were called up by some Algerian guys that asked us, guys, do you want to play football? And we moved the trash bins in this massive square and we played the five on seven. It was just like it didn't make any sense. But we played a very hard fought Italian-Algeria game. And Dean, you will be happy to know that the Algerians eventually 
snatch the, the Colonne di San Lorenzo Cup, <laughs> you could call it. it. It's one of my best memories in that square. Definitely is a country, uh, I realize, like many Northern African countries that really feel so strongly about their football. Going back to the unpredictability of the AFCON, do you think that it's also unpredictable also for managers to draw up an, an, an effective strategy when there are so many players that play in so many different leagues, they play in bigger teams, smaller teams? Do you think that as a, as a, as a weight on the final result of what we eventually see in the game? Yeah, b- before I come on to that, I'll just tell you, Algeria absolutely love. Italy like when the Euros are on or if Algeria haven't gone to a a World Cup I don't know why but everyone supports Italy I remember the World Cup final I think uh 2006 it was Italy France right and then um obviously Algeria do not like France at all because yeah I can can imagine that there there was there was a vested interest (laughs) in supporting Italy right and uh and since Italy beat France in that final. The love Algeria have for Italy is huge. There's Algerian singers. There's a, there's a singer called Saul King. He went to Milan. He made a song called Milano. It's got like 200 million views. Um, Every time an Italian, uh, an Algerian musical artist bursts onto the scene, they name themselves after an Italian city. There's like a singer called Jalil Palermo. There's a singer called Torino Milano. It's, it's very weird. (laughs) And there's a famous Italian song, um, and it starts like lasciatemi cantare. Yeah. Con la chitarra in mano. <laughs> Io sono un italiano, un italiano oh, vero. vero. That's the one. And <laughs> I remember when we went to a World Cup once, we made our own version of that song and changed the lyrics to, to Arabic and French words. So there's 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 huge love for for Italy in Algeria. But anyway, like you said about the the managers and and the players being so dispersed across the world, really, I think that's we don't look at it as a as a hindrance. I think that's what makes it so beautiful when you when you see all of them come together. There's that unity. For example, when England play, they all see each other week in week out. They're all in the Premier League. When Algeria play, you've got players born in France, you've got players born in Holland, you've got players born in England, you've got players born in Algeria, you've got players from all different sorts of backgrounds, all coming together because they've got the same blood and the same um, inheritance. And, it, and it's really beautiful. And they love coming together to play. And they actually enjoy it more than playing for their club. And it, it's really beautiful how you can have, for example, a player like um, Mares playing alongside someone from, from the Algerian Domestic League. And like, imagine someone like him playing against playing alongside someone who's on like you know, 200 grand a week in the Premier League. I think that's what makes it so beautiful. Same with Egypt. You've got Salah playing alongside people from the Egyptian League. And and that's what makes it so special. I, I can't think of of many other international tournaments where you have things like that. And of course, because of the diaspora, and of course, you've got, you've got a lot of parents of African countries that have moved into Europe and obviously grown their children up in Europe. And yet their children still want to dedicate themselves to the country of their parents. I just think that's what makes it so beautiful and and seeing all the players come together as one you know they're not gonna they're not gonna all travel to Cameroon to then go out in the group stage and fly back after one two weeks they want to be here for the long haul so you see a lot of determination and and it's never been a problem for managers of course you have got sometimes uh, managers at club level refusing to release their players I think you've seen uh, Dennis at at Watford has, Mm -hmm. has, has not been able to come uh Andy Delore Algeria striker at Nice, he's not been able to come. So, unfortunately, you do get instances like that sometimes. But that, that's kind of to do with the, the tournament being played in January during the domestic league season. It was good last time when we won it because that was in the summer um, when the leagues were finished. So, so in terms of the players being spread around, it's never really been too much of an issue. I, I was meaning more, do you think it's an issue for the managers? I'm thinking, for example, since you were talking about Italy, of the Italy-England the European Championship final. For Mancini and his staff, it's got to be, a pre- I mean, it's never easy, but a pretty easy job. You know how the Premier League is structured. You know that uh, actually 99% of the English players play in the Premier League. And so that's the same way of thinking of the English team. You just need to know how Serie A works, more or less. You know those star names. So my question was more like, do you think that this diaspora makes it harder for managers to study the tactics? Also because then maybe there are these kind of unknown players that you don't really even know what to expect from. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously it does make things more difficult, but what you tend to see is that you have to get the balance right. You, for example, Algeria can't just call up a bunch of players all born in France because when mm. they, if they're all playing in Europe and they come to play on these Cameroonian pitches, and I'm sure you've seen what some of the conditions are like, they're going to completely yeah. struggle. You've got to have the balance right. That's why with our team, you've got a mixture of, of uh, people born in Algeria, playing in Africa, mixed with the likes of of Mares and, and Slimani. And you, you've got to have players that are, are willing to run, players that are used to playing in the heat, in those high temperatures, and, and players used with that humidity. Because, for example, Mares is, is playing in cold Manchester for most mm -hmm. of the year, and he's now coming to 35, 40 degree heat in Cameroon on players that are almost, uh, pitches that are almost like sand. So when you bring in players into the team like Ben Lamry, like Ben Sabaini, who have been born in Africa, raised in Africa, Yusuf Belayli, Bunaja, they know what it's like. And when you blend them together, again, it, it doesn't become a problem. It becomes almost like a um, a blessing, really, because otherwise they'd struggle. And that's why you do see players playing alongside these European-born players, and they don't seem to look out of place. They seem to gel well together. Beautiful. Well, you obviously, the players we know about the in the Algerian team, like the Mares, Slimani, etc., and these are players that we are, we are aware of. Who are the players in the squad that you would say that people should be keeping an eye out for or people that you think oh, this might be a breakout tournament for them within the Algeria squad? Well, I think that... Ismail Banassa, who I'm sure you know all about, um, was was player of the tournament, the last one. He is a huge player. And I don't want to say that AC Milan aren't a big club because they you, are a big you can, club. You, you can say it. It's OK. In this pod, you can say it. It's, Tommy it's supports into you. Fine. <laughs> you can absolutely say it. You're welcome. <laughs> I just like Banassa is capable of playing for like a a Man United or a PSG or a Barcelona, I think, or mm -hmm. a Real Madrid or a Bayern Munich, like that level above. Of course, AC Milan, as much as you probably dislike them, they are a good level. And they he was are, obviously, yeah. at, he was at Empoli, I think. He came from Serie B with Empoli yeah. and then he advanced. But before that, he was he was at the Arsenal Academy. He was he was signed by Arsene Wenger. I'm so, still disappointed we let him go, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm still disappointed, yeah. Yeah, I remember Wenger signing him and he was this unknown quantity and... Vanessa is going to have a huge tournament and many Algerians feel that the draw in the first game was due to the fact that Vanessa was suspended because we basically didn't have a central midfield. He's going to come back mm -hmm. for the second game because his suspension has been served. So Vanessa, again, I think he could he could might get a huge move in the summer, but we'll see because, of course, if AC Milan do keep making the Champions League, he probably doesn't feel like he needs to leave and he's comfortable in Italy. But I just think there is going to be another step up for Vanessa. I think Yusuf Atala, right back, if he mm -hmm. stays fit, because his big problem has always been injury. This guy, brilliant going forward, brilliant going forward, love to get forward, uh, plays in Nice and Liga, and of course, Nice are flying high at the moment. He's going to have a great tournament, hopefully, and he's obviously going to have the world's eyes watching him at the moment. So, Banasa and Atala, two very good players. Yusuf Belayli, again, had good Arab Cup. He's currently not got a club. Um, so, Belayli is, is looking for a move to Europe, and I hope he can... He can perform big time, but we, we don't really tend to have one player that carries a team. I know we've got Mares, but we don't like rely on one guy. Mm -hmm. It's very much a collective team effort. If you see Algeria go far in the tournament, it won't be because of one top scorer. You'll see the goals sort of spread around. And um, I just think as a team, they're a very good side and not the best individuals compared to like Egypt having Salah and, and Senegal having Mane. But as a team collective playing together, fighting for each other, and with a manager who's Algerian, of course, because the ma majority of these countries at this tournament don't actually have managers from the country that they're managing. So you, you see a lot of foreign managers on, on the touchline, whereas we've got an Algerian manager and uh, Senegal have got a Senegalese manager and Nigeria have got a Nigerian manager. And that's why I think those are the ones that tend to get further in the tournament. So Banasa and Atal, Two players definitely to keep an eye on. Don't be surprised if our title gets a few assists crossing from the right-hand side. And um, Banassa in the middle, I'm sure you and the listeners know all about him. What a player. He runs midfields. 
Beautiful. And uh, besides Algeria, which of course we're not going to ask you uh, to make a prediction about where Algeria are going to end up in this tournament because we, we, we expect you to say that they will win it. Um, which are the other teams uh, that you think uh, will have a saying in this tournament? Uh, which one are the best teams so far and which could be the revelations in your opinion? I think any AFCON, no matter who it is, you have to consider the hosts as one of the favourites because it's in their country. They've got the fans. They'll fill out the stadiums. A lot of referees are pressured to help them. You've already seen Cameroon get two penalties in the first game. They they will go far, Cameroon. And people forget 2017, they actually won the whole thing as well. So they have got good players. I think you'll see Cameroon go quite far um, with the likes of Abubakar, Chupamoting, Turku Akambe up front, Anguissa in the middle. They've got a decent side. They've got Anana back from his banning goal. So Cameroon will go quite far as hosts. If Cameroon don't get to the semi-finals, it's going to be a failure for them. Of course, I have to back Algeria. I think this is the best opportunity to see them go back to back. And they've got the players. They've got Mahrez in his prime. And apart from Cameroon and Algeria, Sen Senegal with the team they have and the fact that they've never won AFCON ever, if they're not going to win, if Senegal don't win AFCON now, they're never going to win it because this is this is their best opportunity. Of course, 2019, they got to the final, narrowly lost against us. Senegal are going to go far as well. You're going to see them get a few players back. Koulibaly obviously missed the first game. They're going to have Mendy coming back in goal. They're going to be very tough to beat Senegal. And with the tournament now being played in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Senegal are going to be used to the conditions better than Algeria were because last time it was played in in North Africa and Egypt. So Senegal will have a slight advantage there. So I think Senegal, Cameroon and Algeria are the, are the, are the three main favourites for me. I, I said those before the tournament, so I don't really want to change my mind. What about staying in uh, Northern Africa? Uh, what about Egypt and Morocco? What do you think? No, not, not no. a chance. I'm, not I'm, a I'm chance. sorry. I, I, don't, I don't... Egypt, right? And you saw Nigeria do this, right? If, if you stop the supply to Salah, you've stopped Egypt, genuinely. If, if you stop the supply to Salah, it's, it's not about stopping Salah, it's about stopping getting the ball to him. Because once you mm -hmm. stop that, you've nullified Egypt. They ain't got a plan B, okay? The last World Cup in Russia, Salah literally qualified them by himself. I don't, if you, of course, if they, if they can't stop the supply to Salah and Salah does start scoring, then it's a different story. But I just think so over-reliant on one player and, and Carlos Quiro as a manager is already under huge pressure and I do think Egypt are actually prioritising qualifying for the World Cup with, with the playoffs in March. I think the Egyptians are more bothered about making the World Cup in Qatar, which is around the corner from them, rather than actually going far in this tournament. So I don't feel Egypt will go far. As for Morocco, of course, Hakim Ziyech has decided not to turn up. So there's already been behind the scenes issues. And a lot of people rate Morocco very highly. I just don't see it. I think there's there's not enough there for me. And I could be proved wrong, but of course the manager, Halil Hodzic, he uh he took he took Ivory Coast to Afghan. He went out in the quarterfinals. He managed Algeria before, he went out in the group stage. So I just once Morocco come up against a good side, I think they're going to struggle. I know they beat Ghana and last AFCON they got nine points out of nine in the group stage, didn't concede the goal, and then went out in the last 16 to Benin. Of course, they went to the to the Russia World Cup and they finished below Iran in their group. So I, I, I just don't think Morocco have enough there, especially without Ziyech, to go far. I, if, if Morocco get past the quarterfinals and Egypt get past the quarterfinals, I'd be very surprised. But I guess you never know. Anyone anyone could win it. Well, so I, I, was, you said, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I was quite impressed with Morocco against Ghana, but admittedly Ghana were absolutely terrible and helped Morocco look at, um look quite good but I was quite impressed with them I thought they were one of the few they were one of the teams that stood out to me in this first kind of match week uh, if we say but if we talk about the first round of games obviously it's been kind of memes all over Twitter and Instagram about how it's just been one nil 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 one nil what do you think is the reason for this? Is it just because there, there wasn't a chance for warm-up games and friendlies? Or do you think there's another reason as to why it has been such a tight tournament so far? Um, yeah, you're right about Morocco did look good against, against Ghana. But in the warm-up games, Algeria only had one warm-up game and we beat Ghana 3-0 mm -hmm. in a friendly. So like it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not an amazing... And then we went on to George Sierra Leone. It's not like a... This isn't a good Ghana side. They're very mm. much in transition. In terms of the results, 
the one nils and the nil nils and and you know nine out of twelve games being one nil. Um, I don't. It's not to do with the quality of players. Mm. It's to do with the conditions. It's very very hot in Cameroon. It's literally thirty five degrees every game. That's why you're starting to see more water breaks taking place during the games. The playing conditions. The grass is awful. The it's it's breaking up. You know, you're seeing passes go out of play. And it's very hard to play in these conditions. The last AFCON in Egypt was actually meant to be in Cameroon, but they weren't ready to host it. The stadiums weren't good enough. That's why Egypt ended up hosting it. So they delayed it to now. And the, the stadiums and the conditions and the infrastructure is still not up to standard. And unfortunately, it's letting the tournament down. So it's harder to score. And with there's been 12 goals in 12 games. And the XG was actually 26 goals I think or something like that so like the chances are there they're just not being finished so hopefully in the second round we're going to see more goals because teams are going to teams that have lost their first game are going to have to push in the second game and have to commit more bodies forward but I I don't blame the players I think the conditions are are bad I remember watching AFCONs growing up and used to see games finish like 5-3, 4-2, 3-3 and that's because there were generally better pitches now in Cameroon the pitches, the heat, it's hard, it's hard. But that in the knockout stages, they are putting more games when it's dark. So hopefully there'll be more goals later on in the tournament. Or maybe we are misunderstanding everything and the African continent is trying to communicate to us with the binary code or Morse code, one nil, <laughs> nil, nil, <laughs> nil, one. I don't know, man. I was looking at the results. It's even difficult. I'm not a betting man. But if you were a betting man, you understood how it works. It's one nil or nil one. But you still have to get the one that is going to win. And it's not easy, right? I think it's, it's a bit of a mind loop <laughs> where you catch yourself and you can't get out of it. All right. Rory, have you got a... Um, I, I knew you had a few more questions for our friend Dean. Yeah, well, uh, basically, I just wanted to talk about some players that have stood out so far or some players that, again, we should be keeping our eye out on, not just within the Algeria team, but in the tournament kind of more broadly. Like, we, we have the players like Tapsoba that people kind of know to look out for or Barrow at Gambia, but are there any young players in the other squads that you think are going to be, like, breakout stars from this tournament or could have, like, a kind of key moments to decide games? Um, that's a That's a good question. I think, obviously, there's the household names that everybody knows about. But there's always one or two hidden gems throughout the tournament. And I think it's hard to tell now because with um, with some of the COVID cases and some of the mm-hmm. squad situations, it's hard to know who's even going to start some of the games. I mean, if I had to pick now, I, I could see... Well, like for example, Kessie, the, the Milan midfielder of Ivory Coast. Um, a lot of people know him anyway. But I think he's going to have a fantastic tournament in, mm-hmm. in midfield for Ivory Coast. Um, Bisuma from Mali, who's at Brighton. I think he's going to have a very good tournament. I mean, he came on against Tunisia and just blew the midfield away. Mm-hmm. So I think Basuma is going to have a very good tournament for uh, for Mali. And generally, it's 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 usually the unknown stars. For example, the Sierra Leone goalkeeper against us. No one knows who he was, but he was fantastic, <laughs> yeah. and I'm sure he'll continue to have a great tournament. But uh, so th- there's a few players. I thought I thought that. Stephen Corker would would have a good a good tournament for Sierra Leone because you know he used to, he used to play for Liverpool and he, he used to yeah, play yeah. for England and he, he has got quality there. I thought he'd have a good tournament. I think overall though it, it it's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell, but um, hopefully one or two stars will, will break out and obviously get moved to, to bigger clubs. That's always nice to see. I think at Nigeria Moses Simon on the wing is going to be mm. a, a big star and and move on from Liga. Moses Simon very highly rated. He's going to have a great tournament as well. And the Ghana winger, uh, Suleimana, who recently moved to um, to Liga, he, he's a very exciting prospect. And a lot of people are, are excited to watch him as well. Yeah, he was he he was like the one bright spark for that for Ghana in that Morocco game. I think as like as an Arsenal fan, I had a close attention to Thomas Partey, and he had an absolute <laughs> nightmare. But Suleimane really did stand out. You're right, really exciting, incredibly like incredible dribbling, really like always focused, like going to goal, really direct. Was really impressed, really impressed with him. But. Um, before we kind of wrap up, I also wanted to. I'm a bit of a kind of geek when it comes to like small, like 
less kind of minor leagues and stuff. And one of the leagues I've kind of been looking at on Football Manager weirdly is the Algerian League. Um, now, I know that within Africa, it's a very competitive tournament, right? Huge crowds. Like how... I saw that this year the table's quite close. Like, how would you kind of advertise the Algerian League to someone if they wanted to get involved in it? I've started looking at a few of the teams and I've kind of found myself down a few YouTube wormholes and stuff. Right, if, if you want me to be totally honest about the Algerian League, lads, it's uh, it's corrupt. Like, Oh, really? There's <laughs> okay, right. a lot of, of African <laughs> leagues that are genuinely corrupt. Like, genuinely, the, the richest team will win the league every year. And, okay. Um, what... What used to happen was the gems that would come out of Algeria would come from a club called Parad Paradu, Paradu, I think. Okay. And um, we'd then give them international caps, which would increase their value, and then they'd get sold to Europe. That's what kind of happened the last few years. So Rami Ben Sabaini and Yusuf Atal uh, and Hisham Badawi, who's not at the tournament, all came from this club. Mm-hmm. Um, got caps, then were sold on for, for huge money to Europe. So, like, the Algerian League is the worst league in North Africa, and I don't. We don't actually have any players from the Algerian League going to this tournament. I, is there a with corruption the, option on Football Manager? <laughs> I think they tried to kind of leave that out of the game, but I thought because obviously with the Arab Cup, it was only players that were playing within. Africa could play in that tournament, right? You weren't mm-hmm. allowed to, like, you couldn't bring players from outside Africa, right? So there you, must could be some from the, you could take players from the Middle East. Middle East. From the Middle um, East, sorry, right. Which so is what, Which is what we did. So, so there must be some quality within that league, right? There must be some good players knocking about in that league, even if it's not the most level playing field. Oh, yeah, but what tends to happen is if there is a bright spark, they get spotted very early and they're not in that mm-hmm. league for long. They would get moved on very quickly. Even now, the good, the main ones from the Algerian League have literally gone from there to the Tunisian League because the Tunisian League is actually competitive. So okay. a lot of the players from the Arab Cup and even at this tournament are from Tunisian clubs because they've got a good tournament. Uh, generally, the African Champions League has been won by a Tunisian club in recent years. So uh, Yusuf Belayli was at this club. Uh, Badrain, the centre back, Chetty, Benny Arda. We've got a few players in this squad from the Arab Cup as well that play in in Tunisia. But that Arab Cup team, for example, was mainly comprised of players from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia. Okay. Um, like, and then those players that did well have come with us to this tournament. So, for example, Yassine Brahimi, who was in playing in Europe for years for Porto, is now playing in Qatar, and obviously we're able to call him up. So that's okay, why we had right. that golfing quality to be able to take players. You know, Bunaja went, Belayli went, Ben Lamry, the goalkeeper, Rice and Bull, he went. We were able to take good quality players that just happened to play in the Middle East. Um, and, and ultimately, that's probably why we won the tournament. Nice. And we wanted to ask you also, um, growing up, who were your uh, footballing idols hailing from Algeria? And also, what would you tell our listeners is the best game ever played by Algeria? You know, somebody's feeling a little, mm, a little, he wants to relax on the couch, watch an incredible moment in football history about Algeria. What would that moment be? The best moment ever would probably be the 1982 World Cup when Algeria beat Germany 2-1. Um, and the press were saying before the game that Germany would win 10-0, 11-0. And then Algeria won the game 2-1. And then Algeria won their second group game. And then in the third group game, Germany and Austria passed the ball around for 90 minutes to knock Algeria out. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the... It's, it's literally from hero to zero. But of course, beating Germany was a was a huge deal. And that's why 2014 World Cup, Algeria tried so hard against Germany, took them to extra time and um, and almost knocked them out. So the 1982 in was huge. For me growing up, um, obviously, Algeria, AFCON weren't great. It used to be an achievement just to qualify for the tournament. And we didn't... And then what happened was in about 2002, 2003, was, was FIFA changed the rule where if you'd played for France under 21s, or any under 21s, you could then switch to another country. In the early 2000s, you couldn't do that. That's what's allowed us to bring in 
these these good quality foreign born players. Well, every country's been utilizing the rule, but it was Algeria who'd pushed for the rule within FIFA. So growing up, we we had some okay players. We had a guy called Karim Ziani who, who used to play for Marseille and Wolfsburg. We had um Jamel Mesbah, who was in Syria, I think, for a while, even went to AC Milan somehow. Yeah, I, re- I remember Mesbah. Mesbah, um, you should remember him too, Rory. He the, was the, it against the, Arsenal. Yeah, the the yeah. game that Arsenal lost, the th- they they almost uh, overturned the score. You lost four 0 at the San Siro, and then you won three 0 at the Emirates. Mesbah, yeah, had, yeah. Had, had <laughs> Mesbah, yeah. He he caused the penalty that uh, Robin van Persie took. I remember he made a sandwich with a bate. They like squeezed an Arsenal player in the middle, penalty, and then he scored. Yeah, but my spot besides that that episode, I remember him being quite good, uh, especially before he moved to AC Milan. Yeah, yeah, he's now he's now at Afcon as part of the coaching staff, I think. And also right. Inter had Inter had um, Belfodil, Belfodil, and Tidea together. <laughs> But I, never I, made it. Yeah, well, but Belfodil, man, Belfodil is is a sad chapter. Um, <laughs> they were supposed to be the him and Dicardi, the future of Inter Milan, and then we all know how the story went. And Dicardi, of course, did quite a bit more than Belfodil did. But Sapir <laughs> there, I remember he he was pretty good. And I read an article recently that uh, he didn't get paid. He was playing in Saudi Arabia, and he started a lawsuit against the team that he was playing for. And uh, lost the lawsuit, and he's broke. And the I, I think oh, he God. like wrote an inst- in a uh, Facebook yeah. post uh, asking for help, and that was very sad yeah. to see. He's yeah. homeless. Morris, Morris donated money to him. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. That was very sad to see because I remember back when we had Mazzarri uh, as a, as our manager, Taider was a starter, and he was a, he was decent considering the quality of that team. He was pretty decent. Yeah, yeah. And I have another question for you, Dean. What would you say, like for Italy, is definitely France. What would you say is the biggest possible rivalry for Algeria, both in Africa and in the world? Well, of course, in the in the world, it's it's uh, it's it's France and yeah. and Germany because of what I alluded to about what happened in 1982. Mm-hmm. And Algeria have actually beaten Germany more times than Germany have beaten Algeria. Funnily enough, no, that's and- sweet. It's weird, isn't it? And also, in Africa, there is a huge rivalry with Egypt, which has stemmed for decades. And in the twenty for the twenty ten World Cup in South Africa, of course, Algeria beat Egypt in the qualifiers. Then Egypt beat Algeria, and then they were neck on neck. So they had to play another playoff in a neutral venue, um, which caused many violent scenes. And, and Algeria ultimately beat Egypt one nil, um, and then. At AFCON 2010, Egypt got Algeria in the semi-final and Egypt beat us 4-0. Oh. And that was because we had three red cards in the game. <laughs> so that was not, a, not too much of a surprise. We literally had three men sent off. We had one after about 20 minutes. We had no chance. So Algeria, Egypt is huge. And of course, if Algeria come first and Egypt come second. They're going to meet in the last 16, which is going to be unbelievable and not safe. So Egypt is, is the massive, massive rivalry. Beautiful. And before we wrap up, we do cover Premier League football as well. And I do happen to know that you support West Ham. So I wanted to very quickly ask you about how you feel about West Ham this season, how you feel about David Moyes. Just give you five minutes to talk about your beloved West Ham. Oh, I love that. I I said I grew up in London. I grew up in East London, so I had to support West Ham. And it's just, we're having a great time at the moment. Obviously, we're in the last 16 of the Europa League, which Arsenal Mm -hmm. aren't in. And uh, correct, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 hope, we, we, genu- we genuinely think we can get top four, and this is a big thing to us because the consensus is, as West Ham fans, is that if we don't get top four, then Declan Rice is going to leave in the summer. Mm-hmm. So we have to get top four to keep Rice, and we have to try and go far. And of course, we could also win the Europa League and get to the Champions League as well. So we've, we've, we've got two options to get into the Champions League, and that's going to help us to attract the better players. But Moyes is doing a great job. It's like when Moyes was at Everton all those years ago. It's kind of similar to them. He got Everton in the Champions League once, I think. He came fourth. Mm-hmm. So the things are good. We have had a lot of injuries at the moment, which is why we had a bit of a blip. We've got, we've had the whole, we had the whole defence out. We've only just had Cresswell come back. Zuma's injured. Ogbonna's out for the season. And Kufal's just come back. Two great keepers in Fabianski and Ariola, Of course, Raisu checks probably one of the best partnerships in the league. Only issue is up front with uh, mm. Antonio and if Antonio gets injured and we have been trying to get Belotti the club's been desperate to try and get Belotti in 
to at least give Antonio some competition. But I'd be very surprised if West Ham didn't get a striker in this window. And, you know, even like you look at Chris Wood going to, to, um, to Newcastle. Why have we not gone in for Chris Wood? Like, Chris Wood's got double figures the last three seasons, I think. I'd, I'd happily take Chris Wood at West Ham as backup to Antonio. We've literally got no one. If Antonio is injured, it's the Armalenko up front. It, it's not great. So I think we'll get someone in up front and that will really help the top four push and the Europa League push. But uh, the one I've seen links recently is Gabriel Barbosa. I think he's coming yeah. in. So that would be a great move. Like Tommy would be aware of Barbosa and how it didn't quite work out. At I, don't, I, I still don't know what to think about that guy because then he had that incredible Copa Libertadores run where he was scoring in every single game. I think that guy is just, I, you, you can't, he's like an FCON. He's the living FCON. <laughs> like you expected the unexpected from him. That's what I would say about him. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take him over having no one. He's, he's, he can't be that bad. He's, he's in London at the moment, I think. So hopefully we'll get him in. Yeah, I, I well, like actually, that. I, I would love to see him in the Prem. Every time I've seen him play, he's been exciting as hell. And of course, finally, finally, you've got the Algerian link within the West Ham squad, Ben Rama. Just how good is this guy? I've been so impressed with how he started life in the Premier League. How good do you think he can he can become? Oh, I, th- I think he can go to the very top. But he's a, he's a confidence player. Like mm. he'll score three games in a row and then we'll go five games without scoring because his head's down, then he'll get dropped, then he'll get put back in and score a goal. So yeah, AFCON, for example, he, he's 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 on the bench, right, for the first game. Mm-hmm. He's obviously annoyed he's been benched. He's come on with five minutes to go and he's missed an absolute sitter. If that was for West Ham, he, he would have scored it. But yeah, I'm good. It's nice having him. I told him to come to West Ham when he was at Brentford, funnily enough, and he did. Nice. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we can Genuinely, give credit to you for him being there. That's good. My, it's literally on my channel. You can watch it back. Like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to have Ben Rama at the club. We had Faguli at the club a few years ago. That didn't work mm-hmm. out. I'm glad Saeed's had a chance. And Moy's like, he sort of signed someone and then he beds them in. Like, when Ben Rama came last year, you didn't see him really firing. But same with when Four Nows came. Same with a few players. Antonio, when he first came, wasn't wasn't firing straight away, and then Moyes made him a striker. So give these he gives these players time, beds them in, and they do very very well. And and it's great to have Ben Rama at the at the club. And um, I think it'll be quite hard to to keep hold of him. It'll be quite hard to keep hold of all our players, to be honest. The way Bowen's going, he's probably going to leave. Mm. Um, that's why we're trying to get Lingard back. Yeah, he's he's been unbelievable this season, Bowen. I think he's been unlucky to not get an England call up. I'll be honest. Um, I think that it's one of those things that just because he's not at in quotes a fashionable club, sorry West Ham, that he's not been called up yet. But his form definitely deserves it. And Dean, before we say goodbye to you, what can you tell our listeners about where they can find you on YouTube, on social media, if they want to follow you? What are your uh, plug your channels, please? Oh, thank you. Yes, I just have a YouTube channel where I talk about. Um... Algerian football it's just my name Dean Ami, and uh, I ramble on about Algerian and football on there so uh, if you type my name in YouTube you'll see it pop up where I talk about AFCON or so I talk about Algeria all the time even when it's like friendlies that no one's watching or qualifiers I, I ramble on about them so um, yeah Beautiful. we're getting that unbeaten record Tommy okay we're getting that unbeaten record I'm just telling you now <laughs> come back to me in a few weeks right man, uh, yeah, unbeaten. records are there to be overtaken so i i would be happy because it would raise the bar for an italy team that is absolutely i mean the re, the most recent stuff we've seen was pretty woeful but dean we'll be going covering the afcon all the way till the end it would be our pleasure to have you on whenever you want either on our monday night live shows on twitch and youtube or we can record another interview like this on a thursday to then publish it on a friday for our spotify and apple podcast listeners it's been a pleasure to have you on anything else to say to our listeners just thanks for having me on guys i'll definitely come back one day yeah so uh, appreciate your time and as in italy we would say forza italia what is the algerian way to cheer for your team <laughs> you say uh you can say allez le vert which is french for go the greens okay or you can say one two three viva l'algerie one two three go algeria let's go then forza Beautiful. algeria i will say it in italian thank you so much <laughs> Dean. thank you And that was it, our first AFCON guest, Dean Ami. It was a great interview. I found it really interesting. What did you think, Tommy? 
Yeah, man, the Algerian-Italian connection, let's go. Mm. I love it. But also, I have to say one thing about that. I think that by defeating France in 2006, we, get, we won the hearts of a lot of countries. And I don't need to go in detail why, but I think that a lot of countries were just like, Italy is actually pretty fucking cool. And so, well, it's beautiful to know. I, I actually That was really know pleasant. That. Maybe you need to switch which team you're supporting, Tommy. Maybe you need to like... Back your Tunisian, your Algerian, sorry, oh, your Algerian God. brothers. That was that was Whoa. that was a slip. I apologize. I apologize. Whoa. I hope Dean Dean is not <laughs> listening anymore. Um, okay, Rory, how are we going to do about this? We have to preview Serie A, Premier League, and of course the Afcon. Should we go with the Afcon last? Yeah, let's do Afcon last. Let's do Serie A first. Go, Tommy. Okay, Serie A kicks off on Saturday with Sampdoria Torino at 3 p.m. Central European time. And at 6 p.m. we've got the ownership derby, Salernitana Lazio. Ooh. Salernitana are coming fresh from their first win in God knows how long. You have to scroll up, up, up to go to their last win before the previous one. Uh, on October 26th, they defeated Venezia 2-1 and uh, they've just beat Verona. So there is something about going, traveling to Veneto, this region in northern Italy where both Verona and Venezia are from. But I think that this is going to be a tough one also because Lazio needed to bounce back after the defeat against Inter Milan. Juventus at 8.45 p.m., always Central European time, will have to bounce back after being spanked in their little black and white butts by Inter Milan in the Supercoppa final. And they take on Udinese. Udinese, who have lost their previous game 6-2 against Atalanta, and I recommend that you read this Gerard de Olofeu post on Instagram, which was very touching because he said the only reason why we decided to play that game was for the love of football. We're all professional footballers. This is the thing that we love. This is our job. But the regulations did not make any sense. We didn't have enough players. We didn't have the time to train. And uh, in the end, we still played. We, lost, we got better the 6-2. But it's not important. I hope you guys can understand. That was beautiful to read. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, it all kicks off at 12.30 with Sassuolo, Ellas, Verona. We have covered how Sassuolo are in great form. Uh, despite having won only two or the last five games. The game against Empoli was very emphatic. Let's see if this, war, this, this form can keep going. But of course, on the other side, there is a Verona team, which is going kind of downhill in this part of the season. And they've got only one win in their last five games. And notably, they lost against Salernitana, which should be a motivation alone to try and perform in this one. Venezia Empoli is at 3 p.m., Roma Cagliari at 6 p.m. And the big one is at 8.45 p.m. on Sunday, Atalanta versus Inter. Now, Muriel is back in form, ladies and gentlemen. He also scored in the Coppa Italia fixture against Venezia. We will see how this game will end. Everything that I know is that the first leg of this fixture, we were at the San Siro together with Rory, and it was a crazy, crazy game that resulted in a 2-2 draw. Now, before, uh, the end of the, before the end of 2021, uh, if you remember, Rory, I kind of went through this incredible streak of games that Inter Milan were going to have. Mm -hmm. And we are two games into that streak, and it's two wins. The one against Lazio, the guy one against Juvazio, uh, Juventus, and then there is Atalanta. There will be then two easier games against Empoli and Venezia, and then it goes Milan, Napoli, and the Liverpool. So, defeating Atalanta away from home would definitely be an incredible result. And then, let's see if there is something left on Monday. Of course there is. Bologna-Napoli, listen, listen. Oziman might be finally back in the team. Milan Spezia and finally Fiorentina Genoa. Now there are rumors that the new Genoa ownership is thinking of sacking Shevchenko oh, to be replaced by guess Rory? Oh, I don't know. A manager who's managed there eight times? Ballardini, of course, the yeah. Italian Jeff <laughs> Bezos. Dude, I don't know. The new the, everybody thought that it was about Mr. Preziosi, the former president. Mm -hmm. It's not about him. There is something about Ballardini. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. He's put a spell on the club. Everybody just like <laughs> calls to it. Like, why do you call this caretaker manager if then you're always going to sack him? What is the point, in your opinion? 
I have no idea. The amount they must have paid off to him in contracts now in like firing him. He must have put his kids through, like got his kids mortgages quite easily, if you know what I mean, or paid off their mortgages at least. Right. Let's move on to England, Rory. What is the action all about? So it kicks off tonight, as you will be hearing it. I'm going to stick with Central European time, just so not to confuse you too much, guys. Um, nine o'clock, we have Brighton taking on Crystal Palace in what is one of my favorite derbies. Uh, both of these teams coming off games which ended 3-2. Brighton winning 3-2 against Everton. Crystal Palace losing 3-2 against West Ham. Brighton now have two wins in their last three. Palace have one win in their last three. So in slightly different form. But this derby is always worth checking out. That is on Friday at 9 o'clock. Then on Saturday at half past one, a massive game. Manchester City host Chelsea. Now, obviously, Manchester City are currently 10 points clear at the top of the table above Chelsea. This is more just for pride, really, I suppose, for Chelsea. Try and keep some momentum going. They've drawn four of their last five. City have won their last five. City being at home, you would probably say they're going to win it. But as we've seen with Chelsea, they're definitely capable of upsetting them, namely in Champions League finals. So it will be keen. It will be interesting to see how this game goes. The Saturday four o'clock kickoffs in Italy are Norwich taking on Everton, two teams in terrible form. We have Wolves taking on Southampton, fresh off beating Manchester United 1-0 at Old Trafford. Wolves definitely one of the surprise packages this season that people aren't really talking about. Southampton starting to get some form together, looking a bit more comfortable. I think this could be a really interesting game. Then we have Newcastle taking on Watford with their new signings. Not only do they have Trippier, they've just spent $25 million <laughs> on Chris Wood and announced it with a joke about erections on their, tw on their Twitter profile. We have Wood. Got a lot of time for that uh, for that joke. <laughs> this signing is really interesting. Twenty five million for Chris Wood. Now he's got double figures in all his in all of his seasons in the Premier League. He's not the most like fashionable player, let's say, but he's very effective. And more importantly, he weakens a direct relegation rival. Like they've taken their relegation rival's best striker off them. They it was basically it was a release clause, so the club had no choice. He signed for Newcastle. And it'll be interesting to see if he can hit the road uh, hit the road running, hit the floor running. Um, it'll be interesting to see. And the way that, like the type of football Newcastle play, lots of crosses into the box, he could do quite well. Um, at the same time, Burnley will be taking on Leicester City without Chris Wood, but £25 million richer. We'll see where they're going to spend that money. Leicester, again, starting to find a bit more form, but still having a disappointing season. Burnley can always be a banana skin. Then the late kickoff on Saturday... Half past six, Aston Villa taking on Manchester United. Now, as I said, Manchester United lost their last game 1-0 at home to Wolves. And this actually could be a trickier game. Steven Gerrard will be hosting Manchester United. Um, and Aston Villa, fresh with Coutinho and Lucas Digne now in their team. This could be a really, really difficult trip for Manchester United. They're looking all sorts of lost. There was quotes this week from Ronaldo saying that young players these days don't take criticism. They don't take advice. He accepts nothing less than 100%. And I think, look, if we look at the mess that's going on at Manchester United, I think the attitude of Cristiano Ronaldo, he is a proven winner, right? He is an elite. He has a elite mentality, to kind of coin a Twitter phrase. Um, and I think... The the players, apparently there's a lot of players unhappy with him. I think his mentality probably isn't the problem. I think the mentality of the players that have got two managers sacked and are still unhappy are probably the problem at that club. But we'll see. I think Aston Villa really could pile on the misery um, for Manchester United fans there. Then on Sunday at three o'clock, we have West Ham taking on Leeds United. Liverpool taking on Brentford in what is going to be a real football treat. I think two teams will play great football. And then on Sunday... I'm already bricking it at half past five. Arsenal versus Tottenham Ooh. at the toilet bowl at the Armitage Shanks Arena. We will see how Arsenal do. We haven't really beaten them away for a long time, or it feels like a long time. The last time, I think, was Aaron Ramsey scoring the goal where he shouted, I, this is my pitch. I think that was the last time we beat them there. It was a good while ago. Hopefully, we can do it. I'm not confident, despite the fact that Tottenham are looking a bit of a mess and we're looking okay. Bear in mind, this is before we've played Liverpool, guys. This could be, we could be looking terrible again, but we are looking okay. I don't know. 
The form goes out the window. North London derbies are always great. God, please let us win. <laughs> if, if Tottenham win, they go above us with games in hand, and that's not great for the top four race. So we definitely need to win this game. Come on, boys. And by the time you will be listening to this episode, you will know the result of Cape Verde Burkina Faso. And then on, uh, and then today, for you listeners, we have at 2 p.m. Senegal taking on Guinea. At 5 p.m., Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Morocco, Comoros. And at 8 p.m., Gabon, Ghana. On Saturday, the action is about only two games. Nigeria, Sudan, but especially can Mo Salah's Egypt win against Guinea-Bissau? And then on Sunday, we've got Group E and Group F. Is a day, it's a day packed of football. Serie A, Premier League. AFCON, Rory, buy another screen. I can already I can feel see my struggling. stress levels already as I'm going to be sat on the sofa like, ah, another goal. Oh, this game, this has happened. Oh my God. It's going to be, yeah, it's a lot, guys. It's a lot. In the AFCON, it all kicks off at 2 p.m. Central European time on Sunday with Gambia taking on Mali. It then moves on to Rory's Les Elephants taking on oh. Sierra Leone and at the same time Tunisia, Mauritania in what I want to call a Saharian Derby, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah, yeah, I think at so. 8 p.m., our friend Dean M is Algeria taking on Equatorial Guinea for their first three points of the tournament. Un, deux, non. One, two, three. Vive l'Algérie. But Rory, this is not the end of the episode quote. I know you've got a better one that is going to put together two of our passions, actually three of our passions, Inter Milan, the AFCON, and the hatred for a certain team. So we are going to finish with a quote from the great Samuel Eto'o, who when questioned about why he refused to join Tottenham Hotspur, he said this, Tottenham, and I hope the English fans will forgive me, are a club in mid-table and I need more. Thanks for joining us, guys. We will see you on Monday. <laughs>